Good evening. What a glorious spring evening this is, and it's a time that I, th I hope you will enjoy as much as I know I will in honoring two very special people that I think all of you know and have enjoyed over the years, and the importance of them to this institution and this library is so dramatic when I look at the outpouring of people who have come to this very special event. And I am very proud that I can be a small part of bringing the honor that we would like to bring upon Dr. W. Robert Parks and Dr. Ellen Sorge Parks this evening. Thank you again for coming. This event is also a milestone in a very important program on campus. And it's one I think you've all enjoyed, but you may not know its name. And it's called Art on Campus Collection. And it's a program that goes back, maybe not in a formal sense, but certainly goes back to the founding of this university and the design of this wonderful campus. In the mid-30s and fifth through the 50s, we had celebrated artists like Grant Wood and, and P, um, Christian Peterson, who enriched our surroundings. And fortunately, the state of Iowa saw fit to start a program called Iowa Art and State Buildings. And we were also very fortunate on campus, through the vision of Dr. Parks, to create what we call the University Museums. And because of both that program and the planning and the programming of the University Museums, art continues to flourish at Iowa State. This portrait that you will be seeing this evening is the latest in this magnificent collection. A collection, I might also add, with great enthusiasm, is well represented in the Parks Library. You see this, late, this beautiful mural over here by Doug Shelton, Unlimited Possibilities, is a striking example of the energy that we have on, on art on this campus and how much it grows with us as a community. And of course, behind us are Chris, uh, Grant Wood murals, is designed by Grant Wood. And again, it takes us back to the 1930s. This room also is a collection, is, also has a major collection of portraits of university presidents. And again, that's also part of the, of the Art on Campus collection. This is also an especially meaningful event to the University Library and its staff whom I'm representing this evening. As this evening honors and celebrates two individuals of great significance to us. We are extremely pleased to join you in this historic event in being the first to view what will be a treasured representation of two individuals so prominent in the history of this library. Before I proceed with some some additional remarks, I would like to take this opportunity to thank some, a few individuals who, are in, who were responsible for making this event possible. But before I do quite that, I'd, also, I'd like to thank Dr. Parks and his family for their wonderful enthusiasm for this project. And his entire family is here this evening, and I'm just delighted that you all were able to come. The colleagues that I would like to uh, mention to you are from the University Museums and the library. And if you wouldn't mind standing when I mention your name, and again, this list is not long, but I really want you to see the people in addition to me who helped make this possible. First and most importantly, Lynette Pullman. Lynette, as I'm sure you know, is the director of University Museums. So I was bragging about how we all benefit from what Lynette brings to her position and what the university museums do for us. She was an adventurous partner. She had wonderful guidance and support. She had infectious enthusiasm and an energetic and professional attention to all the aspects of this important commission. Dana Michaels is also here, I believe. And Dana is the curatorial assistant with university museums. And she was instrumental in identifying potential artists for Lynette and me to consider, and to all the aspects and details of the actual commission. So thank you, Dana. 
We had a very important committee made up of library staff who were responsible for planning this event. And I would first like to mention Rick McCants, who is behind you, so it may be kind of hard for you to see him. But Rick is the director of development for the library, and he chaired this events committee. And we had some tirelessly working people on this committee, and if you could please stand. Tanya Zanish Belcher, Edward Gedekin, Ed just waved to you, Kelly Moore, Joan Mueller, Nick Osnes, Wayne Peterson, and Chris Zareth. Thank you all, and thanks also to all the rest of the library staff who helped with this event. As I look back on the time in which uh, Dr. Parks was president, and I was here in some fashion through all those years, and it was a wonderful time, as I'm sure for those of you who were here remember. It was a time of growth for this university. We truly became a university. Um, but most importantly for me for this evening is what this library became while well, President Parks um, served as our leader. Uh, this library grew physically. We had two additions added on to it um, in 1967 and then again in 1983. When Dr. Parks became president, we had 9,000 journals. And I'm sure at the time we thought that was a lot. You may think it's a lot, but believe me, it isn't a lot. <laughs> we now have over, tw uh, when Dr. Parks uh, re uh, retired as president, we had over 20,000 journals. What that represents is a growth primarily in the research uh, mission of the university since, since journals and serials are the most important part of communicating in a very rapid way. But also just as importantly to this collection was our book collection. And we added over one million books to this building collections during his presidency. These are significant to us as we try to manage the collection, and they are also, in a sense, rather dry statistics. But most important is the sense of vision of what this library became. It went from, I would say, probably a rather ordinary university or college library, and at the end of Dr. Parks's presidency, we were truly a mature major research library that I would stand, uh, would say that we can match any, could match any research library in the country. He also had the vision of hiring very good people around him, and one of which was after two years of a presidency, um, Warren B. Kuhn as the director of this library. And they shared a vision of what this library could be, and certainly that vision became reality. So to end my remarks in terms of what Dr. Parks and Ellen meant to us is that it was not only, of course, just statistics, but it was also a sense of vision and importance of place. Ellen was one of the most enthusiastic users of this library, and many of us who worked, in, worked all through those years of Dr. Parks' presidency knew her by sight. She had the most energetic step you could imagine. And she was just so enthusiastic and you know she could just make you smile the instant you saw her. She loved this building. She loved the collections. But she was more than a user. She also decided what she thought we should buy. <laughs> and how wonderful. Because she had an intense curiosity at, in all things for those of you who knew her, and her sense of scholarship was very important to her. So she would write notes to the history bibliographer, and she would let him know, or her know, what she thought we should buy. And so not only are our collections grown, but they were also enriched of, with her role in how we are as a library and what we have in our collections. I'd like to thank a number of you, because I recognize a number of you, and I know a number of you, many of you contributed to the Ellen Sorge Parks Memorial Fund for, for books. And we have, um, over the past nine months, 
been buying books from that collect from the from the donations that you gave in her name. At some point this evening, I do hope that you come over to this side of this room before or after the reception and take a look at some of the books that we have bought so you can tell that we have treasured and done a good job. We've had good stewardship with the money that you gave in Nellen's name. And so she lives in another way in our collections as well. Shortly after I became dean, Lynette, I don't know if she does this with all administrators, but she sort of took me on a tour of the library. And we looked at the art. And we went through this room, and then we went outside those doors, and we paused and looked at that magnificent portrait of Dr. Parks. And she reminded me that that portrait was part of the presidential series, and that for some reason that series ever left, we wouldn't have that portrait. That won't happen, I assure you, in our lifetimes. But that, in reality, there was never a portrait done that represented the two individuals for whom this building is named. Most people think that that is a portrait that not only recognizes Dr. Parks as president, but also in terms of the naming of the building. This topic had come up before. Um, it was not new, but and in fact, Dillis Morris had brought this to the library's attention several years before. And you know how d busy, days are busy and things get lost, and, but Dillis never forgot it, and certainly Lynette never forgot it. And I was immediately drawn into the enthusiasm that both of them had on the need to have a portrait that commemorated both Ellen and Dr. Parks in their contributions to the library. So we worked fast. We had a trip up to, many, uh, to St. Paul. We had looked at portfolios of a number of artists and decided that there was really only one that we thought could do justice to these two special people. And we took the portfolio over to Dr. Parks and his daughter Cindy looked at them as well. And they agreed that it looked like this artist could probably do it. So in the winter, Dana and Lynette and I drove up to St. Paul and we met Kurt Anderson. And it was a joy to meet him and everything from his portfolio showed in terms of the work that he had in his studio. So to make a long story short, uh, in that aspect, uh, we asked Kurt if he would consider uh, painting this, this portrait, and he very happily said he would. This now leads me to a more formal introduction of the artist, Kurt Anderson, who has a few remarks that he would like to share with you. Kurt is a nationally recognized painter of portraits, still lifes, landscapes, and figurative work. He has exhibited in galleries around the country, from New York to Carmel, California and his commissions have ranged from um, book covers to portraits of corporate presidents. He has exhibited in numerous museum shows and has received, numerous, and received many important awards, including the Stacy Foundation Scholarship for Artists. Kurt is the author of Realistic Oil Painting Techniques, which has been, for those of you who know something about painting portraits, a major seller on this, sub on this subject nationally, and also won a prize for the 1996 Minnesota Book Award. Please join me in welcoming Kurt Anderson. Uh, thank you, Olivia. Um, there's clearly a great tradition of uh, here at Iowa State University of Art patronage and acquisition, and I consider it a real honor to be, uh, to be a chosen to paint this portrait and to have it displayed among so many great and significant works of art. I also consider it a real honor to have been asked to be the one to create a, a visual statement about the legacy of uh, Dr. and Ellen uh, Parks. Um, it's a, it's a responsibility I haven't taken lightly. I have to tell you that when Olivia showed me where this portrait was going to hang, which is uh, right out in the lobby area of the library facing the entrance, I was amazed. 
I realized uh, that it was going to be um, a central location in this university. The, the library is, after all, probably the most central building in the university. It's um, the building that most people uh, who work and study here use and, and are in uh, more often than any, any other single building. And for students, uh, it's probably their, uh, their home away from home in terms of studying. So the library, I realized, was going to create for this painting a very central location in the heart of this university. And it meant that I had to create a painting that was uh, worthy of that central location and that, uh, as well as being be living up to the, uh, the legacy of Robert and Ellen Parks, who were so central to the, uh, the contemporary history of this university. It was decided early on, because Ellen wasn't able to pose for this portrait, it was decided that we would uh, that I would portray the parks at an earlier stage in their lives. Um, but I did get the opportunity to, uh, to draw Dr. Parks. I actually came up, came down to Ames, and he posed for a brief session, and I, and I did a, um, a charcoal and chalk study. It was actually in a room uh, right over here. It turned out that the typing room had a nice uh, high north-facing window. And so we kicked the typist out and were able to use that as a studio for, for a day. And that was, that was very important. It was, it was uh, very valuable for me to be able to, uh, to get to know Dr. Parks. And, um, and it was a real pleasure, too. I would have enjoyed doing the entire portrait uh, there. Um, And I also have to say that that, that, that session gave me some, some idea of how important the parks have been to the, to the history and to the, to the current makeup of this university. When I came up here, to, um, I spent the, the night at the, the, the Union, and I saw the paper the next morning, and they were running a series on the history of Iowa State University, and it, and it just so happened that day that they, um, they were talking about the student unrest during the Vietnam War. And what the article made clear was that Dr. Parks was, was unique among university presidents in his ability to, uh, to talk to the students and to communicate and to, uh, to um, to deal with that situation, making Iowa State University unique among universities and avoiding the sort of violence and student strikes that was happening in universities all around the country. So I asked Dr. Parks about that and got to know a little bit more about, about his career here and how the university had grown exponentially under his leadership and, um, for instance, how it was under his leadership that a fine arts and studio arts program was started here. So I have some idea of how this portrait is going to be seen on so many different levels by uh, those of you who are uh, part of the life of this university and have been part of its uh, recent history. But I'd also like to tell you a little bit about what I was trying to bring uh, to this portrait. Um, as the painting began to evolve on the canvas and I would come every day to my studio to paint it, I would find myself looking into the eyes of, uh, of Ellen. And on more than one occasion, um, I found myself uh, talking to her and unburdening to her some of the, uh, the issues of my life. And I think it was because she seemed to be the sort of person you could do that with. Um, and I think I saw in, in Ellen and Robert Parks perhaps a bit of my own idealized, uh, uh, I idealized vision of, of parents or grandparents. And, and I, um, I think I brought that to bear in the painting. 
Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, that this painting will bring sort of a familial presence to the, to this, the heart of this university. Most, uh, most students who are here have only recently left their homes, have only recently left their families and are on their own for the uh, first time in their lives. And it's kind of my hope that as they walk past this portrait or look up at it from their studies, they'll feel sort of the um, kind, uh, sympathetic, solicitous presence of a parent or a grandparent. So that's, that's one thing I was trying to bring to bear to this portrait. But what's, what's really most important to me, what, what I really hope, is that uh, Dr. Parks and his family, and all those of you who have uh, been close to them, will, um, will like this thing and will, uh, will feel that this is a uh, fitting tribute to their lives and their legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. The next part of the program in our honoring of Dr. Robert Parks and Dr. Ellen Sorge Parks is for President Jiski to come and give some remarks of his own. It is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Jiski. He's the 13th president of Iowa State University. While there have been many changes in higher education in Iowa State, since Dr. Park stepped down from his presidency 14 years ago, I believe that there are core institutional values that remain, and they even go back to the very beginnings of this institution. We are a land-grant institution, and as such, the state of Iowa has entrusted this institution to educate its youth, encourage them to be lifelong learners, as well as to help ensure that each generation of Iowans enjoys an enriched quality of life and environment, as well as economic prosperity. President Jiski, I believe, has continued this rich legacy with the entire university community and has embraced these responsibilities with passion and vigilance. Dr. Jiski. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Isn't it uh, fitting that the person who is welcoming us uh, tonight and who is now in charge of this incredible knowledge resource, uh, our library, is one of the many, many very successful people who attended Iowa State between 1965 and 1986. In Olivia's case, as a young student, um, uh, but uh, many others who are now in positions of uh, enormous responsibility, not only here at this university, but throughout the world. It's very, very fitting uh, indeed. Um, uh, there are literally thousands, indeed tens of thousands of people who are products of a very special time at Iowa State, uh, a time we now all know as the Parks years. Uh, earlier today, we celebrated the 100th birthday, uh, a, a 100th birthday uh, on the campus. It was the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the construction of Marston Hall. And at that birthday celebration, I reflected back on the contributions to Iowa State of Anson Marston, for whom Marston Hall is named. And I made the comment that the, the time when Marston came to Iowa State in the early 1890s was very much of a golden age uh, for this institution. I truly believe it was. It was the beginning uh, of this new land-grant colleges programs. They were being shaped in people like Anston Marston and Charles Curtis and Lewis Pamela, among others, uh, who came at that time, played a major role in building a foundation for the programs in agriculture and engineering that uh, enabled them to achieve national and international prominence. I also noted at this uh, celebration that this era of Marston and Curtis was not Iowa State's only golden age. There have been others and uh, at least two 
come to mind. Uh, one is the era of the 1940s and 50s that was uh, defined by Iowa State's big three in science, uh, Frank Spedding, Henry Gilman, and Jay Lush, uh, all members of the National Academy of Science, which is absolutely extraordinary um, for such a small college at that time. And the other golden era, without question, absolutely without question, is that era I referred to as the Parks years, the presidency of w Dr. W. Robert Parks. Um, it's uh, conventional to say that almost any record can be broken, and of course we recently witnessed uh, that uh, in baseball with uh, Roger Maris and then both Sosa and McGuire, uh, not just breaking a record and sh but shattering it. And so records are made to be broken, at least in baseball. But I want to say, as one of Dr. Park's successors, I'm here to tell you that his record of 21 years as president of this university may be more difficult to break than McGuire's 70 home runs. Um, I don't think I will do it. <laughs> but what makes the Parks era, the Parks years, so significant uh, indeed, a golden era is not just the span of years, but what occurred during those years. Uh, the record is absolutely remarkable, and I must tell you as someone uh, who uh, is one of uh, Dr. Park's successors, I'm absolutely dumbfounded, uh, marvel at uh, what happened. Nearly half the physical campus we now know as Iowa State was built during the term of his presidency. The College of Veterinary Medicine, the new football field, the Iowa State Center, which in many ways is the physical representation of the coming of age of Iowa State as a university, major academic buildings, enrollment almost doubled, three of the eight colleges of Iowa State were formed, there was a tremendous growth in the humanities and the enrollments and the program offerings, and Iowa State developed academically into a university. Uh, and it was during the Parks years I understand that Iowa State went to its only football bowl games four times. Some of us are quite envious of this, although I also happen to know that the Cyclones didn't win any conference basketball titles <laughs> during that time either. All of this and much more, including expansion of research and outreach programs, residence halls, student services, all of this occurred during the Parks years, making it without question the most expansive period in Iowa State's history in terms of facilities, in terms of students, faculty, and staff, and in terms of expanding our academic programs, research programs, the cultural life of this institution. Uh, it will surely be forever known as the time when Iowa State came of age as a university. Uh, there's another aspect of the Parks era that makes it particularly significant and special to the Iowa State University family. This was not a Parks singular, but a Parks plural era. Uh, there was Dr. Parks, the president of Iowa State, and right alongside, and I understand sometimes in front, was Dr. Parks, the first lady of Iowa State. Ellen Sorge Parks was an accomplished and gifted scholar in her own right, but she gave up what would have been undoubtedly a remarkable and outstanding career as a teacher, scholar, and researcher to become a partner in the team of Dr. and Dr. Parks that was to lead Iowa State University for 21 years. She served as wife and mother first and foremost, but also a very, very gracious university first lady, and as we have heard, a strong advocate for some of the university's most important programs and services, especially this library. And because they made such a great team, it is altogether fitting not only that this facility be named for both of them, as in the W. Robert Parks and Ellen Sorge Parks Library, but that there be a portrait of this remarkable, gifted, and wonderful couple placed prominently in this facility, the academic heart of this university they devoted so much of their lives to in which they led to unprecedented levels of excellence. The entire university community and family, one that, as you all know, extends literally to all the corners of our globe, felt a great loss 
when Ellen Parks passed away last year, and we continue to express our condolences to Bob and to your family. We miss her as well. But the people who knew Ellen well, including a great many of the people here tonight, tell me she would want this party to go on and for it to be a good one, a happy one. So from all of your many friends and colleagues and the many thousands, indeed tens of thousands of students who became products of the park's years, we express our deepest and most sincere appreciation to this team, this team of Dr. and Dr. Parks, the architects and builders of one of Iowa State's golden ages. Thank you, sir. Well, first of all, I want to uh, pay my great respect to two people, Lynette and then Olivia. For, and this should be a great night for you because, by George, I think you really did it. You pulled it off. <laughs> and I'm sure it wasn't all that easy, but we do appreciate it very much. And uh, Dr. Jiski, you also have a few words for you. First, I could have done all right in athletics if I could have just put my hands on a few more Johns. <laughs> there was Maury John, Johnny Bohr, and Johnny Majors. We did all we could. And I want to say this in serious mood for, to Dr. Jiski and Patty that Ellen and I have always appreciated their thoughtfulness and their kindness in how they treated us. Um, and actually, they, did, they added something to this old tradition of communication between the present residents and the old residents. Because they started, I suppose they're still doing it, calling the place our place. Because we lived there so long, I suppose. Uh, your place, they always said, I can remember Patty here calling Ellen up several times saying, Ellen, would you come over and see what we're doing to your place internally and so forth? <laughs> and she did. But you know, that really was just a pretty sentiment, sentiment because actually it wasn't done. Because there's no way eh, that Dr. Jiski, with the personality that he has, a strong, strong personality, an awesome power, could ever pull it off because he couldn't he shouldn't, he couldn't, and he wouldn't change the ownership of that board, that uh, house, really. And the reason I know that it never got changed is that in all the 10 years that they have lived in our house, I have yet to see a rental check coming in. <laughs> but I really don't mind, as a matter of fact, I don't give up completely because, you know, <laughs> When it rains, it's poor, so it might be just a possibility, outside possibility, that I might get my check on the very day that it's announced that I've won the jackpot. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, we'll remain friends. Now, uh, Kurt, I want to say a word or two about Kurt here. I had intended to say more, actually. Well, we have some personal relationship. We shared the same boss. His mother was also one of my bosses on the Board of Regents. She was a good one. Uh, Peg was a very good one. Uh, and, but, uh, and she did her homework. Uh, she was, uh, uh, one thing, she was never showed any partiality, partiality of one university over the other two. And believe me, they were watched for that sort of thing. Uh, she uh, supported the university, but she was no rubber stamp. You could always hear Peg's voice. 
and Kurt tells me he could hear a voice too for a long time. <laughs> I was going to uh, say some more, uh, blow his horn a little bit more for the work he's done, but I decided with all the O's and ah's that he got, maybe I wouldn't do that because I started worrying whether Olivia and Lynette uh, were actually good enough business people to sign that guy to a real fixed contract when, he, uh, when, he, when they took his commission. Because you know, artists are not supposed to care for money, but you know, as the praise goes up, sometimes the price goes up also. <laughs> <coughs> well, enough of this. Get down to business. If, if Ellen could be here tonight, oh God, how I wish, I wish this could be. But if she could be here tonight, she would be pleased with everything, I think. Now, I don't know what, I, I, it is, that's a little modifier that I put on the end of it, but it has meaning. I'm gonna ask my two daughters here, uh, Andrea and Cynthia, to back me up in this. Because I, I, I put in that modification, that condition is that Ellen absolutely did not like to have her picture taken. Am I right? See, see her hand. She did not like that, and it became, we knew it all the time, because when we, somebody tried to take her picture, they'd get a grimace or say, get the heck out of here, go away, something like that. But it came to us really uh, very forcefully when Bob Underhill, I see he's here tonight, Bob Underhill was doing this uh, biography, uh, which did, I think, raise some interest locally, uh, called uh, Alone Among Friends, and he and the press very much wanted some good pictures of Ellen, uh, because absolutely, she was the one among friends who was most alone with me. And uh, they wanted some good pictures of her. Uh, they, the um, institutional pictures were there, of course. The pictures that are taken when you're first lady, so-called, uh, they were good pictures. Happily so, because that was one of them right there from which uh, uh, Kurt did his uh, wonderful work. Uh, but. They really wanted something. She had a life of her own beyond that. And they wanted pictures, some meaningful, some good pictures of her uh, as a part of that life. Something that told uh, some stepping stones, as you could believe, in her life because there were many good ones. But actually, we, I, we tried to do the best we could for Bob. So our daughters, the two of us, the three of us, the girls, now I went down to the basement, looked, took off those old shoe boxes where we had the pictures stored. And we found there really weren't, there really weren't any good pictures taken by a capable uh, photographer of those years. There were lots of pictures to be sure, but they were all sort of, you know, little two by four pictures, uh, uh, really sort of candid camera shots because that's the only kind you could get of her. And they were very redundant, very repetitive. Uh, there were quite a bit of them, those, but they were very repetitive because they, most of all of them were done in two different, or in different places and on different occasions. One of, them, one of them was uh, a great many pictures uh, from our Sunday, summer vacation in Cape Cod, which she liked very much. And she'd be sitting on the beach there, uh, probably under her umbrella. And it was easy. After all, access to the Cape, to the, to the beach was free. It'd be easy to slip up and take her picture, although she might at that time put her big floppy hat over her face. But one thing she's more likely to do is try to cover herself with a beach towel because if there's anything she did not want was to have her picture taken in a swimsuit and distributed here and there forever. <laughs> uh, another, another occasion, the second one, which is really important in her picture, you could see it over and over again. I say it was redundant, it was really repetitive because the same thing happened year after year. But <clears throat> that, this it was a tradition which I'm sure is familiar to most of you, uh, Christmas morning. Now on Christmas morning, uh, these things happen. Uh, first thing, whoever was the youngest grandchild, that happened to be Ellen, uh, Caroline there for some time, had the job <coughs> of getting all the old folks out of bed before they wanted to get out of bed. But then we assembled in the living room <coughs> where the Christmas tree was located, and we started opening the packages. And our sons-in-law, Doug Van Howling and David uh, Hamilton here, seemed to take that as a clarion call to start taking pictures right and left, which they did. And in that, they were, they were mostly interested, of course, they were mostly interested in taking pictures of their own kids to see what they did and said. 
but they took one or two grandparents too, which we submitted to. But the whole thing I want to say here is that Ellen was excessively uh, modest about how she looked in pictures, and she didn't like to have them taken. But you can't say, it wouldn't be right to say, and there are plenty of people in this audience who would correct me, you can't say that she was equally modest in all other things. Because <coughs> she was darn smart and she knew it. <laughs> she didn't flaunt it, at least not very much. But there are people who were witness uh, to her uh, wide store of knowledge. I see Jean Peterson back there and Elroy, uh, members of our book club, uh, Judy and Dave Hoffman, and Julie and Dave Wilson, all were members of our book club, and they knew that Ellen was there. Well, what she really was, what she really was is sort of an, uh, an encyclopedia in residence, because most of the questions that were wanted, they uh, turned to her, particularly questions having to do with English history, which uh, some people thought she must have done her graduate work in that field. Actually, uh, true, she didn't do it that way, because she only had one, what we call it, uh, structured instruction in English history, which was a survey course as an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin. But that must have planted the seed, as Martin indicated there, and went, because she kept building books after books in that field until she had, according to Warren Kuhn, one of a really fine collection of, of English letters and, and, uh, and, uh, and tapes and wills. Uh, now, the what, what I guess I'm trying to say is that uh, Ellen carried an awful lot of information around in her head. She seemed to remember just about everything that happened. She could remember when she, what she read, what she heard, where she was, where she'd been, and that sort of thing, and where she didn't go, where she wasn't, and that was fine. I enjoyed that. But the frightening part is she remembered the same thing about me that she remembered about herself. So I think it could be reasonably stated that to live with someone who has that kind of ammunition ready to fire at any time is sort of a, tri <laughs> is sort of a trial. <laughs> but I'll say this, if it was a trial, we managed for 59 good years, and I'd much rather live with that trial than to try to make a life without it. Now, I started off by saying that um, Ellen would be pleased if she could be here. God, I wish, and I do. Uh, but uh, I think, with the qualification. Now, all things considered, we'd have to really change that opening statement to this and say, if Ellen could be here, she would be pleased with everything. I'm pretty sure of it. Because of this sort of things, these sort of things, uh, all things considered. Number one is Ellen was a very considerate person. She appreciated things that people did for her or with her. And oftentimes this became really the base of forming of friendships with many of the people here and also the basis for her friendship developing with, with a wide diversity of people. Now secondly, about the portrait herself, although uh, she didn't like her picture taken, she'd like it because what's not to like about it? And uh, she'd probably say, I'm sure she would, she'd tell her to say what, what flattered her, but you know, I can live with that because in my book, if an artist, if an artist can't produce a portrait which looks a little better than the person in real life, as far as I'm concerned, that artist should cut his fees in half or perhaps should look for another <laughs> job. Well, another thing that makes me sure that she would like everything here tonight, aside her appreciation for those who did this, was the and her, well, another fantasy about Ellen and the portrait. I can just see uh, some afternoon, uh, she would get the keys to the car if she could find them, and she would say to me, Bob, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be gone for a while because I'm going to the car, but I'm gonna stop off at the library uh, in order to see what's, uh, what's new in the reading room, the leisure reading room. And of course, to get to the, leader, uh, the reading room, you'd have to go right by that picture and matter of fact, I believe where, where Olivia <coughs> intends to hang it, you'd have to go right by that portrait to get anywhere in the library. So she would stop and take a look at it, I'm sure. Uh, another thing that I think she would like, and this sounds a little self-serving, but I do think she would appreciate us joining together in this picture, 
just as it meant so very much to her to have our names joined together on the front of this building, uh, engraved in concrete, no less. But, and as I look at this portrait, I consider it to be Ellen's portrait. It's the only one she had taken, but as my likeness uh, is scattered around recent years, it's sort of disgusting. This was her, this was her. And another thing I'm sure she would like about the portrait is that it is to be placed permanently in the library, a place she was very, so, so very fond of. And finally, you know this has to be a sentimental occasion. And I think Ellen would be very glad indeed that all the members of her family could be here for this, which may indeed be the last roundup, the last opportunity that all of us will have in public to say what Ellen was, who she was, and how very much she meant to us. So in conclusion, I want to say on Ellen's behalf, on behalf of, behalf of the family and myself, that we do appreciate what's been done. We sincerely do appreciate that, uh, that everybody who ever did everything to make this occasion happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Parks. That was a wonderful tribute to a woman who meant so much to all of us in this room. And thank you for sharing her with us. Everyone who comes into this building will see two individuals who are so honored in this community. So please accept my heartfelt thanks for coming this evening, and I look forward to having you cool off downstairs, and I hope to see and say hello to you downstairs, and thank you again.